Uh, first, what I handed out is um, the top part. You'll see it says the top two pages is basic training module specification. This is uh, what um, Pablo or Judge Cortez told me that uh, I was to talk about today. The second two pages, and I think they stapled them together, but the second two pages are kind of my answers, okay? So you kind of have to look at them together, uh, separate them a little bit to make any sense. And when I was asked when I first got here for a copy of my PowerPoint, this is my PowerPoint, <laughs> okay? I'm not one of the computer people, so this is, as my boss says, this, I'm the old-fashioned, old caveman PowerPoint, so this is what you get You're on it. Manager. Yes, I am. I was raised on a farm, so yeah. But of course, we have computers out there now, but not when I was growing up. Um, so what I like to do when I do any type of class at all is, if you have questions, ask them. Okay, and if I think you look like you're falling asleep on me, I'll ask you questions just to make sure you're you're paying attention. Of course, I'm probably in danger of going to sleep myself. I had a softball game last night that went ten innings for kind of uh, it was a crazy thing, but fun. I see you don't have a name there, but I'll call you no name. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, the first thing that I'm on to uh, just I guess we'll just jump into it. The the first thing that we talked about. And, and here is the difference between uh, or understanding the juvenile law. Basically, there are a number of different rules that apply to juveniles that you'll need to know, but there's a lot of them are the same. They're entitled to the same due process rights, constitutional rights, etc. In fact, what you could probably do is say they're entitled to a little extra um, protection. Okay, and there's specific laws that are geared uh, specifically towards juveniles. Okay, and. The, like I said, the biggest difference is you're going to have to understand that most judges and most probation officers, juvenile probation officers, are going to bend over backwards to protect juveniles. Uh, sometimes to the point where you go like, really? Are you serious? We had a, a, a probation officer one time, we knew there had been a shooting at Garfield Park because we saw blood, and we, they tracked the blood to a certain area, and then it disappeared. So we knew somebody had been shot. We knew that a couple of kids had been in the park with, with guns, but we could never find our victim. Well, it turns out the probation officer knew where our victim was. It was one of his kids on probation, but did he bother to tell anybody, oh, I got a kid that's been shot? Fortunately, it was just a minor wound, but it's still, one would think if you had a gunshot, you know, you would tell somebody, but sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. So, all right, I'm gonna just start right on my thing, and I'm sorry, my vision's not very, Good as well. Um, the difference between it, and if you can, you can see on there it says the difference, uh, and it says like one uh, a one a, a difference between a criminal act and an offense committed by a juvenile. Is everybody kind of following what I have there? And if you look over the, the other side, it says none. Okay, the crimes are the same, right? If it's a malicious destruction of property for an adult, it's malicious destruction of property for a, a juvenile. Okay, Th those don't change. I'm trying to make it, yeah, I should have when she took it away, the top two pages and the bottom two pages kind of will correlate with each other. Okay. And then there's uh, talks about a delinquent act and a status offender. Here's where differences really do come in, is in penalties. All right. The biggest difference is a juvenile who's convicted or pleads guilty to something has an adjudication as opposed to a conviction. In the adult world, it's called a conviction. Juvenile world is called an adjudication, okay? And I'm, I'm assuming that you guys have some uh, background in, um, do you have some in the criminal law, like retail fraud, like retail fraud first? Yeah, so much I can't stand. Okay, well then we'll, we'll see what happens. How does a retail fraud first, if it's under 200, how can it be a retail fraud second? Did you cover that? I mean, should they know the answer? Yeah, they know it can be enhanced. Okay, how would it be enhanced? Let's pick on you, Chad. How, how would a retail fraud first, if it was under 200, is there a way it can be enhanced? If it's under 200? Right. Can it be enhanced to retail fraud second? Yes, if they have priors. If they have priors, okay. And how the statute reads is it's a prior conviction. Very good. A prior conviction. A juvenile can f commit 100 retail fraud thirds, and I can't enhance it, okay, because it's an adjudication. The statute specifically says it has to be a conviction. Okay, there's one big difference, okay, and it's really, that's penalty related as opposed to the criminal act itself, okay. The other big difference that I have is as a general rule, juveniles are not going to jail. I rarely can get them in detention for armed robberies, okay. 
And I will be talking about when we can waive them and stuff later, but so there are times when I can have them treated as an adult. But for the purpose of this right now, as a general rule, they're placed on probation. They can go uh, into foster care or an institutional placement. Um, when I say institutional placement, there's a place out in Cal uh, Pennsylvania called Glen Mills. Uh, there's some uh, placements in the state of Michigan. There's some in Wisconsin that we use. And recently, we started sending some kids to the deserts of uh, Arizona. So all very costly, though, when you're dealing with juveniles. So the biggest difference, remember, is that the penalty is what makes the difference. And it also talks about there a status offense. OK, what's a status offense? Crimes that you could have as a juvenile, that you couldn't have as an adult, one would be a runaway. There's no such thing as an 18-year-old necessarily running away, OK? And when I said 18, the law in Michigan is 17 and under. Excuse me, under 17, you're considered a juvenile. And it really creates a weird situation when sometimes you have a 17-year-old, and by law, most things are 18, you know, contracts and all that kind of stuff. So we have a kind of a year there that's kind of an overlap. But Michigan is you're considered a juvenile if you're under the age of 17, an adult if you're 17 and over. So some of the status offenses are going to be like a runaway, um, a truancy. A lot of times you can be uh, not going to school. We can, uh, I can actually charge you with that um, to get you into this, our system to make sure you get going to school. Adults can be charged with a truancy in a roundabout way, which is, I don't know if I've ever sent out some out to your court or not. I have charged parents um, with uh, truancy, which is a misdemeanor, where they just don't get their kids to school. I, I, they, I have some kids who are six, seven, eight, and nine who've probably spent less than, of their three years of where they should be in school, less than a half a year uh, in school. And everybody knows if you start out behind, you're going to end up behind and you're going to be more likely to engage in criminal activity because you have no education and nothing else to fall back on. So I do charge parents sometimes with truancy. Okay. Any questions on the difference between an adjudication and a conviction and the penalties? No questions. Okay. We'll move on to the next little part here. Um, talks about the uh, adult process of trial and the juvenile process of adjudication. Okay. The biggest, there's a number of different uh, things that happen here. One is what they call an arraignment. I'm sure that you've had that where if you go, you arrest somebody, um, you take them before either a magistrate or a district court judge, and they get arraigned. Juveniles do not have arraignments, okay? They have what, sometimes they have a preliminary hearing, and that'll only happen if they're actually arrested and placed in detention and actually remain there long enough for me to write a charge and have an arraignment or excuse me, a preliminary hearing, okay? Big difference, so a juvenile, I've actually had cases where juveniles could probably legitimately say to, to somebody, nope, I've never been arrested for anything because they've never been fingerprinted. They never you know, had their hands cuffed and placed in any detention. They were charged with a crime, sent home, not even charged with a crime, do a crime, sent home with their parents, and the next day somebody brings a petition in for me to charge them. And they, until they come to court, never have anything happen to them. Okay. There's no bond set a lot of times or anything like that. If they are taken to detention, are they, uh, is there a bond ever set? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a, there's a, yes, yes we do. There's a procedure that we've recently, we've tried to put in place. It's been a, the juvenile world as we, my office sometimes calls it, and nobody really likes to step into it too much unless you're already there, is really different. In a lot of years it was just kind of willy-nilly. Okay, kids could be held in detention for no real reason, and sometimes kids weren't held when they were supposed to be. Okay, which of course would beg the question if something actually happened to a kid while they were in detention and they really had no legal authority to be there, and let's say they died or had a serious accident of some sort, the lawsuit that would have could have resulted from that is ridiculous. So what we've done now is we actually do have where um, I have it, basically each police agency knows that if they want a kid held and it's a pretty serious offense, they need to get me a petition. And there's another, I'm gonna talk about, let's do backtrack for a second. They're called petitions, the, the charging instrument instead of, instead of a warrant, okay? An arrest warrant and, and also the, the charging instrument that you'd have for adults, ours are called petitions, okay? So when I'm saying a petition, that's their charging instrument. So if they, like say somebody commits an armed robbery, uh, unarmed robbery, home invasion, uh, anything like that, they can take them to detention now, and we do have a process in place that the agencies are supposed to get me 
a petition right away in the morning so that I can actually set up with a, um, the referee who's going to hear the preliminary uh, hearing for the juveniles so we can set bond. So we do have that in place. Most of the, most of the crimes, though, we don't have them for. So, but uh, some of them we do. And yes? Is the petition signed and sworn by the judge and everything? Else? Nope, that's a good, good question. And that's another big difference is, I don't know if everybody hear the question, is it uh, signed and sworn by uh, the magistrate? No. What we have is our office will write it. And when we send it over, the petition, it usually just goes over to court. And then an intake probation officer will generally look at it. And that person then sends it to a referee to be authorized. Nobody has to swear in anything. They just, the referees end up reading it, making sure that stuff there is probable cause, and then they sign it. So that's how that works. So it's, a lot of times it's kind of a, I can charge something and maybe not even know whatever happened to that case. Sometimes nothing happens to the case for about a year sometimes, which drives me crazy. But it doesn't happen that way. Then uh, obviously the uh, next step then is preliminary examinations. Have you've been uh, already told you have a preliminary examination when you commit a felony within 14 days. Juveniles do not have preliminary examinations. I can literally go from a petition to a trial. No prelims are, are there. And, and actually, which is, it doesn't violate any uh, constitutional things because it's, that's a statutory. Preliminary examinations are actually statutory based uh, in Michigan, there are states that don't even have preliminary examinations. And I think there's talk sometimes, isn't there, that they're going to do away with preliminary examinations uh, on a number of cases, that you wouldn't be entitled to them. So I think that's part of a cost savings in some ways. But juveniles do not have them. And then a big, another big difference, of course, is punishment, which I've already kind of alluded to, is the punishment is just completely different than what you'd get as an adult. Any questions on that? That's that's correct. There's no probable cause hearing. The probable cause kind of we're, our office is second checked then by a referee, a licensed attorney that acts as a referee. They read our uh, the police report and the petition, and then that's they say, yep, there was probable cause. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yes. Unless, unless we're treating the case a little different. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, Pablo was in our office for years and never came over and didn't know. But it, yeah, there, there isn't, and it's kind of weird. It's, it's, I definitely agree that it's, it's weird. Yes? Uh, Rick from Paulson. So if you arrest someone, say they're 18 or 19 for retail fraud, and you're looking at their CCH and they had been you know, charged or whatever when they were like 15 or 16, mm -hmm. would it be on their CCH? Would it read differently? Or? It, it should be on there if they actually had uh, an adjudication, okay? With, with juveniles, we have a lot of services, especially Kent County is, uh, has a tremendous amount of services that are available to, to juveniles. Um, they could have gone to the, um, been diverted out to a, the, uh, the, what I'm trying to think of the name of the program they have for, uh, I think it's ABC, for people who do shoplifting, okay? So it might be on there if they had an adjudication, but it wouldn't necessarily be on there um, because I'm trying to think if I actually cover that in another spot, but since how you brought it up, I'll, I'll talk about it now. In the criminal, in, in juvenile system, they have basically, there's a formal calendar and a consent. Okay. Basically, the biggest difference between this, let's say I charge, I charge somebody with malicious destruction of, of property over a thousand, which is a felony. Okay, but because it's their first crime and it was something that people deem that oh, he's he's a good kid, we don't want it to go formal. We don't want it on his record anywhere. We want it to go consent. So they can actually, the probation officer can actually file a request with our office, because we have to notify the victim, that we want the case diverted from formal, i.e. it'll never be in front of a judge, they'll never have an adjudication on it, and it just goes kind of off to wherever it goes, okay? A lot of our cases end up with this, especially for retail frauds, thirds, runaways, um, malicious destruction of property under 200, any one number of those crimes end up somewhere else until they get a number of them, okay? If they have two or three crimes already that they've committed and they've gone consent and I get a request to go consent, the answer is 
Well, I better not be swearing. The answer is not a chance, okay? They've already had enough chances. Go ahead. If a case goes into consent, will that still be on, re on record in the future? The fact, what will be on record is probably that they were, the, the, a police report or an incident report was generated, okay? And you could probably pull it up somewhere because there, there's still a, a police uh, report attached to it, but it wouldn't necessarily, no, it wouldn't show up in any lien or anything like that. Because it, it's completely diverted from going formal. So that, a, like I said, a judge, no one will ever see that, okay? <laughs> that was where it went consent. It hit intake. The intake probation officer looked at it, asked for consent, and asked that it be diverted out. So when the CCA would see dual adjudication, that's what you consider conviction. Yes. When you say adjudicated at intake, that's consent. Yeah, it's probably considered a consent. So these consent words, do they, when you say they just go away, do they, do they put them in some program? <laughs> they're, they're supposed to be in a program. There's actually a consent calendar uh, probation that they're usually on probation for like 90 days and if they supposed to check in a couple times in an in, uh, intake probation officer and if they don't do anything wrong or any new crimes in with that time period then it goes away and when I say supposed to and I, I there's some terrific people that are doing work um, I have the utmost respect for a lot of the juvenile probation officers and such but sometimes the reality is is they have a lot of cases as well and so they're supposed to be there but how much they track them is really anybody's guess, okay? Um, I would like to think they track them a lot, but sometimes if they're really good kids who just did one stupid thing, then let it go, and if they don't get picked up again, I guess it's really no harm, no foul. Because they usually do have to do at least one, I think, class saying why you should not steal type thing or something like that. I have, uh, haven't walked through it myself, so. But yeah, that, so that's, what, that's the basic difference. Like I said, you can slide it out of there. Now. Once they have a several crimes or they've committed a pretty significant crime, we, our office will object uh, to having it put out on an informal calendar. I should have probably put instead of consent slash informal as well because that's really what it amounts to. Could be about the same difference. And if, we, if our office files an objection and they still want it to go to, or, or even the defense attorney wants the case to be consent or informal, we then can have a hearing in front of a referee. We would, our office would come in with the victim saying why we think it should be put on the formal calendar. Somebody else will come in and say, nope, it should be on the informal calendar. So that's when we can start having hearings on these issues. We don't have a lot of those, but we do get a few. Okay. And, and also, I kind of talk about when you, I think I've alluded to, if you guys go down the rest of this, um, with the adult, of course, you would get a warrant, you know, it's a magistrate, we have you swear you in, and you have to, you know, sign it and such. And then usually it'll have an arrest warrant uh, accompanying that. Juveniles don't have that when we get it. A lot of times they don't get picked up, okay? And a lot of times they're not arrested, like I said, right away or taken into uh, custody, okay? Any questions on some of the main, and those are like a number of the differences, obviously, how we could be treated as a juvenile or as an adult. Any questions on any of those? Okay. Um, the next thing it asked me to talk about was what's the status offenses. Um, and if you look down there, um, you'll see that like a running away truancy, incorrigibility, which is, actually I think I've only charged that once, and it was kind of fun to charge, because it was like, what is this crime? And it's basically someone who just really doesn't listen to their parents at all. They just can't control their kid. They know it might not necessarily run away or they'll run away for you know an hour and come back. Um, but that's another one of the things you can charge them with. Curfew violations are also another ones that adults don't usually have. Um, and then also the, the alcohol, um, it says alcohol violation under there. That, that really isn't a status offense, okay? That's actually an offense that, you know, you'd get anybody under the age of 21 could have a minor in possession of alcohol, okay? So I get the same with the juveniles, okay? So that's not a status offense, although it's listed as a status offense in this module that I was, was given. I would, I would disagree with that um, situation. Um, if you look, go down to the next part, the uh, difference between uh, adults and juveniles, okay, for arraignments, we kind of already did that. 
instead of an arraignment, they might have a preliminary hearing, they might not. We can have bond provisions. Sometimes you're, they're more likely to have an adult and we are in juvenile. Fingerprinting, okay. Fingerprinting has been a very interesting issue through the years for juveniles. Um, it used to be that juveniles hardly ever were fingerprinted. Um, they should have been, but they weren't. And then we had a situation, our office used to cover every city's um, cases as well. Um, city of Grand Rapids would have a juvenile uh, do a, a city offense. Um, we would get it, okay? Until my boss found out about it, and the reason how it came up was when they passed the new law of fingerprinting, that I, you had a fingerprint, everybody who's committed a misdemeanor or above, you're, they're, they're supposed to be fingerprinted. Well, by definition, city, city charges don't have to fingerprint. And we knew as soon as that happened, and no offense to any police agencies or anybody, the second that happened, we knew we were gonna get a lot of city requests for charges because nobody wants to take the time, energy, and effort to take the juvenile to get them fingerprinted, okay? My boss actually, when he found out about this, said, whoa, wait a minute, we're not gonna be doing this city attorney's work of Grand Rapids, so our office no longer will um, handle those, the city of charges, although we used to. I keep telling my boss that we should just get some money for it and we can do it, we're there anyway, so. But that's the reality of it, they're supposed to be fingerprinted. Now with juveniles though, we have come up with an internal system between uh, law enforcement and probation officers. Because technically, you're not supposed to have a disposition or sentence until somebody's been fingerprinted. I don't know if you know that part of it, but that's, that's a requirement, okay? Um, but we do, what we do with juveniles, because a lot of the retail frauds, um, some of our uh, minor possession or our, our lower misdemeanor, okay? Where do they go? Informal, okay? Then what has to happen if a case goes informal, you don't have an adjudication or a conviction, those fingerprints are supposed to be destroyed. Okay, so we don't even make the police agencies as a general rule fingerprint those guys, okay? Any, any juveniles that are arrested because it's just gonna be a waste of time. You're gonna fingerprint, it's gonna get filed, it's gonna go informal, then you gotta destroy it, okay? But for the more serious offenses, they really are supposed to be fingerprinted. And what I generally do nowadays is um, when I have those, when we get the petitions in our office and I'm reading through police reports and I'm charging, um, if I'm charging something where I know it's going to stay formal because I, you know, I know the kid's history, et cetera, I usually call up the detective who assigned the case and said, I, I'm charging this kid, I need him fingerprinted. And then they'll go and process him. And the fingerprinting, why it's so important, and it started to, because now it is being implemented a lot more for our juveniles. I think I've had three charges recently where I've had requests because APHIS has hit on a, a charge and they've picked up the kid's fingerprints. So, and then issues arise if I don't charge a juvenile for a crime they committed when they were juvenile, if I don't charge them prior to the 18th birthday, all kinds of strange things happen. But that's not for this discussion right this moment. Is the fingerprinting thing, is that such a road bump only because it's so time consuming and hard no one wants to do it? Yes, and the other part of it is, is because you're supposed to keep juveniles separate from adults there's only so many fingerprinting you know, areas at the jail or wherever that trying to get somebody fingerprinted sometimes when you're supposed to make sure no adults are present because they're supposed to be kept separated, that's when it gets to be time consuming. You think eventually they'll just move to DNA swabs? Th that's a possibility. Well, I don't know because you'd still need the, the fingerprints. I mean, because we do have DNA um, when they commit certain crimes, we get it, but you'd still almost need the fingerprints. So, but it's a possibility. And our, the juvenile intake probation officers also have um, the ability to do fingerprinting there as well. Although they don't like it when they have to do all of them, but sometimes it does happen. Okay, everybody set in the fingerprints? I don't know, you guys are pretty sleepy here. The only ones awake is Pablo. I'll get you going here in a second. Okay, um, suspect identification. Suspect identification, uh, once again, I think you've been probably told that you, you bring the victim to the defendant or to the suspect and that the suspect doesn't go to the victim. You guys know that, right? Did you guys learn that correctly? Oh, I was gonna say, did you learn that? No, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. if you didn't, number one thing, if you ever have it, you take the victim to the suspect, not the suspect to the victim. 
Okay, that's we've had cases of identification thrown out because of that the other way. It's just the way the law reads, and so that's what we need to do. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next page. Let's see. Oops. I want to make sure I had this correctly here. It's been a while since I actually read my own little thing I demonstrated here. So one of the other things that I think that I that asked about was the differences in terms of inter, uh, interviewing, interrogations, or whatever of juveniles. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Zachary, what would when would Miranda warnings be required? Um, when somebody's in custody and you're interrogating them. Okay, in custody, interrogation. Okay, juveniles have the same rights on that aspect. Okay, you have to if you're doing a custodial interrogation, it has they have to have Miranda. All right. What some of the extra levels of protection that a juvenile has is. Technically, you're supposed to notify the parent before you talk to them. And I say technically on that because sometimes you have somebody who's 15 or 16 and you're, you're on scene and you're trying to figure out stuff, what's going on, and you don't have an opportunity and you need to figure out what's going on. So you just give Miranda and it's okay to talk to them. Just like adults in terms of how the courts view the voluntariness of a confession, Okay, they look to the totality of the circumstances. Okay, with the juveniles, the younger the child, the more they're going to make sure you follow the rules. Okay, which would mean make sure a parent is notified. Um, usually, you have to um, yeah, let's see, make sure a parent. I'm trying to think of my other situations. Technically, sometimes they say you're supposed to take them to detention before you interrogate them which I've never understood. It's always seemed to me the craziest thing. That's just a factor. I've never lost a case on that, that you have to take them to detention prior to using their confession, or t prior to talking to them, okay? The biggest, like I said, difference, the younger the child, you better have somebody's permission to be talking to that child, okay? The older the child, the easier I can say, look, this kid knew what was going on. He's been arrested six times, you know what I mean? He, when you gave him Miranda, he practically read them to you as opposed to you reading them to him, okay? He knew them. And he just didn't know him from TV. He just he knew him. Okay, so those are the things you have to be careful with when you uh, talk to juveniles. Okay, any questions on that? Nope. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Walk, walk away. away. Yeah. It, it depends. Once again, the courts will protect them the younger they are. Okay. If if you're talking to an eight or nine year old or a ten year old, then they might say, yeah, that's you, you should have. The the child might not have understood he was free to leave. Okay, so it's just got to be careful the younger the child. And you're looking at me, some of you guys, I think, thinking, why would I be talking to an eight year old or a nine year old? You will be talking to eight year olds and nine year olds, okay? It is not uncommon, and, and, and although this is being taped, I have on occasion, not a very often, charged a child as young as seven, okay? I don't do it very often. There's some very special circumstances that go behind that, and we treat them with kid gloves all the way through. Okay, but I literally had one time a seven-year-old who was terrorizing all, all the little girls and boys in the neighborhood. By going up, he would be humping on them or he would try to grab them. He would make lewd and rude comments to them. It, it came to our attention, first time around, I said, just get him some counseling, tell this kid he's, you know, he's got to keep his hands to himself, etc. okay? Less than seven months, six months later, okay, the child is still seven, I get another complaint where he had actually pushed this girl down, laid on top of, on top of her, and was humping on her. Okay? Well, now I gotta do something. The parent clearly isn't doing what they need to do, which was supposed to be getting the kid in some counseling. So that presented a special circumstance, because now I have a, an innocent little, poor little five-year-old who was tossed on the ground by this seven-year-old. Okay? 
So at some point, people go, well, that's not fair to the, the, the seven-year-old. The sure as hell isn't fair to that five-year-old, OK? So I have charged young kids. And it's not common. But eight, nine, and 10, trust me, they are committing crimes. And they're getting younger every day. So I didn't want everybody weird looking at me like I said blankly, like, really? I'm going to be talking to an eight-year-old? You will be talking to eight-year-olds, OK? So actually, if the next page on that, if you look on that, that talks about the must consider, I was trying to come up with it myself. I obviously should have just looked at my cheat sheet. You can look at their age, their education, intelligence level, OK? The length of time they're in detention before any statement was made, that type of thing, OK? A lot of them are the same as adults, but they're going to view them a little more suspiciously. When I say they, the courts will, when they're tossing out a, a request to suppress a statement, they'll definitely look at these a little more closely than they do with adults, OK? So just be careful. Always make sure you do Miranda. Just get a hold of the parent if, when you can, and then we're all good to go. Okay. The special provisions, because it talks about difference, uh, demonstrate the understanding of the special provisions in the statute and court rules, OK? The, the special provisions basically is the courts, there's the there circuit court judges, but of the family division, OK? They have the authority to hear all cases involving anybody under the age of 17, OK? And that is what they do. Um, Kent County, we have uh, six and a half um, judges who do that. We have a half judge, Judge Yates, who splits it. He does some adult, half of his docket is adult, and half is juvenile. OK? And so the other thing that comes in there is that this includes neglect proceedings, all right? I also, in addition to doing the delinquency, our office also covers all neglect and termination cases, OK, for Kent County. Um, and that case I was telling you about, the seven-year-old, quite frankly, there's some neglect going on by the parent because they're not properly supervising that child. And quite frankly, as it turned out, no, no surprise to anybody in my office, that seven-year-old had been sexually assaulted himself. OK, so that is one of the main things you're going to see. The parent knew about it and didn't do anything about it. OK, so then we can bring neglect proceedings against the parent on those particular cases. Um, we probably handle, our, our neglect cases have increased a, a ton. Um, so we handle the neglect, and we also will do the termination of parental rights. A lot of times, cases sometimes like that seven-year-old are going to be dual tracks. They can be neglect wards, and they can also be delinquency wards. Um, and services are different, and what you can do are different for them. But the main thing for those is to help the kids out and the parents to learn how to be a better parent and make sure you keep track of your kids. Okay, so we, we cover all of those as well. We do also have the authority, we, the, the courts do, to extend jurisdiction past their 17th birthday. Okay, um, basically, when let's say somebody pleads guilty or they're found guilty as a juvenile. The court can say, we can keep jurisdiction over you until the age of 19, OK? They don't necessarily do it. Or in certain cases, till the age of 21, OK? The, the major case I have on that, I don't know if you guys uh, recall, uh, back in January, a 13-year-old shot his stepfather in the back of the head and killed him, OK? Um, that was my case. And we carved out a plea agreement really specific plea agreement, basically, was that he would absolutely remain under the court's jurisdiction until he's 21, OK? There's some other stuff that I'll go into, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But he has to be under the court's jurisdiction until he's 21. He's waived his right to any hearings that would say that he could be released sooner than that, OK? And he also has to be an institutional placement until he's 21. So while the court only has jurisdiction under the age of 17, OK, when you first get it, it can extend when the person's older. Does that make sense to everybody, that you don't just have to let them go when they're 17? Although some of our probation officers think you do, but that's another story. Um, the other part, this next part I'm going to be talking about, if you, where, see it says traditional waivers, automatic waivers, court designation, and prosecutor's designation. Okay. This is where our office uh, has some authority to treat juveniles as adults. Okay, the traditional waiver is it's not used as much anymore because they changed the law that 
uh, provided for a few more crimes that are committed to give the prosecutor the discretion. A traditional waiver, though, I would have to ask the court to waive this person into the adult system. That happens in a several cases. Remember I talked about we, we had an APHIS hit on a juvenile who committed a crime when he was like 15, but they got his fingerprints now. We know he committed the crime when he's 15 because he's got a fingerprint, but he's 18 now before I've charged him. The only way, unless it's a specified felony, which I'll get to in a second, the only way I can have that person be found guilty or charged, or got charged because we can charge him, criminally responsible for that is if I get a court to waive them. And what I have to do with that, I have to go into court and I have to say to the judge, this person has six other crimes as a juvenile um, and you know he didn't do well on probation. Please waive this crime into the adult court. Okay? It gets really tricky if they have only like one or two priors and they're not very major crimes. Um, I go and ask the judge to do that and they say no. And what happens then with that charge, it's just gone. It's dismissed. So that we could know we could prove it, but because the court can't get jurisdiction after somebody's over the age of 18, we have to, um, they have to waive them to adult court. Does that make sense? Because it's really, that's kind of a tricky one, is that, um, so when those things happen, which is why it's important to do the fingerprints, because we would have caught that person a lot sooner if that, child, if that juvenile had been fingerprinted when they committed their first crime. Okay, because we would have had the fingerprints on record, and we wouldn't have had to wait three years for the hit. We would have had it right away. Okay, yes. With the recruit present, um, with the um, fingerprinting, if wh why is it thrown out if it's if it's, in, set? If it's informal? It, it would be the same with with any uh, the fingerprint. There's actually an entire fingerprint statute or rules that are, have to be followed with this. Like, let's say I was charged with a crime, but I wasn't convicted of it or anything. My prints shouldn't remain on record. Okay, same. I don't think they're supposed to. The same with this. This is something then it would be like it didn't happen, so you shouldn't have my fingerprints. Okay, and that it, it, that once again really comes into some crazy things. This whole fingerprint issue. I will literally get. I have a case right now where a kid. They the police did everything they were supposed to do was they arrested somebody for what they believe was a larceny in a building, fingerprinted them. Our office, looking at it, declined to charge them. Okay, so he was never actually even charged with a crime. But the fingerprints remain on record. He's 18 now, he's trying to get a job, and it keeps popping up. And so they're like, well, I was never convicted, I wasn't even charged with this. So I'm trying to help them by you know, writing to the you know, Michigan State Police saying, yeah, we never even charged this person. So it's supposed to be gone. Okay. Did was there a question back there? Oh, okay. Even when you, even people that are convicted, um, and sentenced are criminal, that mm -hmm. back to get something expunged and waited. The guy now is a doctor in New York. He had a sort of conduct that he 35 years ago. He wants to get licensed in Michigan now, and it keeps popping up. So yep. he wants to get expunged, Sponge. and that's what they'll do. They'll take the fingerprints out of whatever dusty pile they're in. <laughs> Yep. So it, it can cause havoc um, later for some people, so that's why. Um, the other part, the next one, is an automatic waiver, okay? This was a change in the law where our office then had a lot more discretion of when we might have somebody treated. And I, I've been talking about specified felonies. Okay, those are your major ones. Carjacking, home invasion first degree if you're armed with a weapon, criminal sexual conduct first degree, Murder, second degree murder, okay. Um, those are the ones, if they've committed those crimes, our office, if, if the juvenile's over the age of 14, okay, our office has the ability to say goodbye. We're not treating you as a juvenile anymore. You're off to adult court, okay. The factors that our office will take into consideration when doing that is their age. We don't do it very often if they're 14 or 15. Okay. On occasion, we have done that. I had a 15-year-old uh, on, on a murder case, and he had quite a little record, so we kicked him to adult court. Um, but we look at their, like I said, their age, how many priors they have with us, the seriousness of the offense. Okay. Our office has gotten to the point, because of the use of guns and how much more violent things have been getting lately with uh, 
juveniles, if they're 16 and they've used a gun with it, they're pretty much, it's gonna be, we're kicking you to adult court on an armed robbery charge or whatever, okay? We do work, cut some deals with them sometimes when they're in the adult system, but we're just not gonna mess with them anymore, okay? Because a lot of times they do have priors, they've been given an opportunity, and they just haven't taken advantage of it. So they can, can go off, so. The next one is what we call a court designation. Now that would be a situation where they've committed some of those crimes I just said, but they're under the age of 14. A lot of people have asked me with that 13-year-old, Keyshawn Mann, the, the, as a juvenile, why on earth we didn't charge him as an adult? Well, I did, okay? I charged him as an adult, but because he's under the age of 14, he has to remain in the family division of the juvenile court, all right? Um, and like I said, with his case in particular, we, he has, he'll have what we call an adult sentence. Basically, he'll be in, hanging over his head to a degree, okay? Our plea agreement was that he, if the court ever imposed adult sentence, he had to serve at least 13 and a half years. Mind you, he's getting credit for every second he's on juvenile probation, okay? So it's not like we're double dipping on that. Um, but that's why in those situations, I couldn't just waive him. He was not 14 yet, okay? Any questions on, on those? Actually, I said that was a court designation. I should have said that was a prosecutor's designation. The court designation would be a situation where instead of, you know, that traditional waiver I talked about a minute ago, instead of saying, Judge, we want you to waive them, we say, Judge, we want you to treat them as a juvenile, or excuse me, as an adult, but in your court. And we do that on occasion because there are services available for some of these kids. And quite frankly, I'd rather have them get some services and not be a repeat offender later as opposed to just kicking them up where they're not going to get a lot of services if they're sitting in, in jail. Okay? Okay. Let's see. Next part was... Um, the actions required by a police officer, okay, uh, for handling juvenile offenders, okay? Once again, you see where I'm talking about on that with on C? Apprehension, okay? Once again, same as an adult, if you have probable cause to, to arrest a juvenile you, or an adult, same, same difference. If you've got probable cause, you have it. If they're arrestable, they're arrestable, all right? That's gonna be the same, but keep in mind, sometimes it's gonna have a higher level of scrutiny by the courts, all right? Um, and instead of taking somebody to jail, you would take them to detention, okay, which is off of Cedar Street. Notification. Generally, if you arrest an adult, you don't have to notify anybody. Well, if you're arresting a juvenile, you better be notifying their parent, okay? And the interviewing, we've kind of already touched upon that. Just be careful. Make sure the younger the child, the more levels of protection you've given them, okay? And sometimes that's just not gonna work out either. You're in a situation where you need to talk to a 12-year-old because you've come to on a scene where there might have been a shooting or something going on, and you don't know if this person's a suspect yet or just an innocent bystander. Um, I've always told law enforcement, I don't envy your job for one second. Do what you need to do to protect yourself when you're out there. And if that means talking to a 12-year-old and not notifying a parent right away, you know what, we'll straighten out later. I'd rather you guys be safe, okay? That's always been my kind of response to a lot of questions people ask. I can straighten out stuff later as opposed to, you know, somebody getting hurt when they didn't have to. You know what, we've talked about fingerprints enough. I don't think, I hopefully I don't mention it again because you guys will go, what did we learn? Vicki doesn't like fingerprinting issues. <laughs> so I don't want you to go away with, with that. And I've already talked about the petition, that that's what we call it. Um, the custody, once again, um, <coughs> is the same. If you think you can take somebody into custody, do so. And then the sus uh, suspect identification process, once again, that is um, you taking the victim to where they need to be, to the show up, okay? You make a of custody? Yes. Is there a legal requirement, or is it like a department, or how's it going? Police officer, he makes suspects. Junior here is guilty of a felonious assault. Um, is it at the officer's discretion whether to take them to mommy and daddy and, and hand them off and then go get a petition, or can he or she decide, oh, this one's under detention? 
they can decide that they're going to detention. Okay, you, it, that, that's the decision because they've committed an arrestable offense. Felonious assault would be an arrestable offense. Um, you can then that's your decision. Yeah, it's and just take them to detention. Yes. But once they take them into custody, do you have a time limit on when they need to notify the parents? The question was, is there a time limit of when you should notify the parent? If you're taking somebody into custody, you should try to notify the parent immediately, okay? Um, that's just gonna be a safe practice on that. And sometimes you can't, one, the, the juveniles lied to you so they don't, you don't even really know who the parent is. Two, you can't reach the parent because there's a reason a kid's out running around the street at night is because you can't find the parent. Um, those things will all play into it. But yeah, you should try to notify once you arrest them as quickly as possible. And what we have in place is kind of similar to adult. If you arrest an adult and they need a charge, they're, they're supposed to be charged within 24 hours, okay? Hold a charge against them so they can be arraigned. Same with kind of juveniles. If you're gonna arrest them and put them in detention and it's a sufficient enough charge, like if you took them in detention for like a retail fraud, and let's say you had to take them to detention because you couldn't find the parent, okay? So you're not gonna just keep the kid running around in your cruiser all night. You gotta put them somewhere. By the next morning, by that retail fraud, detentions probably will have found the parent and released the kid, okay? But we have a system in place now where if they commit a pretty serious offense or a, a major felony, then they're supposed to keep them and give my op office an opportunity to charge them and ask for bond. Yes? With the uh, detention, can, can police take them <coughs> in the middle of the night to detention? Yes. Yes, it's open 24 hours, so, and, they wouldn't receive them at night? Well, I've had, that, and that may have been the case at one time, and if it's the case now, it would be news to me, obviously, because I have cases where kids are brought in at two, three in the morning, because uh, they've committed a crime, and they're supposed to be able to process them. And it, it makes, it, it would make sense, well, first of all, if it's nighttime, it would make sense because the majority of your crimes are committed. Well, actually, for some of the juveniles, are committed right after school if they've actually gone to school and, you know, about 8 o'clock. But the other times, if it's committed in the middle of the night, what, if, if this guy's got a home invasion, or, or do we really want to take him home to mom and dad? Heck no. I want that kid in detention, which is where they belong until we can sort out what's going on. So they're supposed to be able to, to uh, take him and process him. Okay, and what happens when a juvenile is taken uh, to detention, as a general rule, they have, um, a lot of times they'll have already have probation officers. That probation officer is then notified right away by detention so we can get working on what we should do with the, the kid the next day. Okay, any other questions on, on that? And the only other thing, that, uh, if there's not, the only other thing that was in this module, once again, the, that uh, Pablo provided with me, I didn't give you guys this initial one, I wouldn't have written it that way, <clears throat> is a six hour rule. And I'm not, I'm thinking, I've never heard of a six hour rule, okay? It might have been something that was in place at one time. Um, you, can, you can certainly detain, if necessary, um, a juvenile. You, you can't just go keep them someplace where nobody's going to know where they're at, obviously. You can't do that with anybody. Um, but with a juvenile, if, if you're, you're doing investigation you've, they're in a police station with you or wherever they're at, you can certainly talk to them as long as you need to talk to them. Okay? But once again, keep in mind, the younger the kid, you better make sure that you know, they know, their parents know they're there, somebody knows you're talking to them, etc. The biggest protection on a lot of these things I tell people too is, is make sure sometimes you tape stuff when you're talking to the, the juveniles because they'll be like, as with adults, I never said that. Shh, here's the tape. Yes, you did. Is that your voice? Type thing. Okay. So just always try to make sure you have that is in place, a tape recorder. You contact a parent. Mm -hmm. Say that junior here's a suspect or whatever. Is it okay to question that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can say yes right over the phone, <laughs> and that has happened. They go yes and keep them, yes and keep them. <laughs> That's we've actually had police be told that, you know, here I got Junior down here, and the the parents respond. You know, can we talk to him? And the the parents' response is yes, and I don't want to see him, and they hang up. Go ahead. What if the parent is really intoxicated or something like that, and they still give consent? 
Question, can they give in, uh, to interrogate if they're intoxicated? I guess if, you, if they're so clearly intoxicated when you're, you're asking the question, um, I would say the answer to that would be, because parent notification and parent consent to talk to is just one of the overall factors that you would look at. So if you're talking to a 14, 15, or 16 year old and you're in custody and you've given them Miranda warnings, if the parent's intoxicated or not, then even if they said, oh no, I don't necessarily want you to talking to my child, you can say, well, I'm gonna talk to your child. And unless they say, don't talk to him because I'm getting him an attorney, that's a different response. So that would be a borderline question. That's a good question. That would just be an overall factor that somebody might look at uh, when they did it. Does the parent really know what they were doing when they gave consent? But technically, once again, it's not totally required to have the consent. It's just a factor that they're gonna take into consideration when they look at it. I had a case one time when how complicated this can get is we had a juvenile commit a crime. The juvenile was in neglect ward, okay, under the temporary uh, wardship of, of the court and was in a institutional setting, I believe at Wedgwood, okay? Now, the question became, who does the officer ask for permission? The parents don't even necessarily have custody of their own child, okay? And the state kind of had custody because Wedgwood was where the child was at. Okay, it got real complicated. And I tried to, when I did my appellate work, run that up and have that question answered, but the court declined to address that issue. So it's still an outstanding issue. Or we've had cases where a parent's parental rights have been terminated, kid commits a crime, and they are not yet adopted, and they might not even be totally in foster care. Who, who do we talk to? Who do you guys talk to? When I get those questions, I go, why did I answer the phone today? <laughs> so, but it's, it's just kind of an overall circumstance. And just look at it and try to figure out who to, who to ask. Who has the, uh, who's the, who trumps who in that situation? If, if uh, I'm a juvenile, I get in trouble, and my parents are notified they come down to detention, I hear my Miranda warnings, and, and I say, well, I'm not gonna answer any questions. And my dad says, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can I? Parents waive my Miranda for me, even if I assert my rights, or do I, or is that the, is that the ace of the of procedure? Uh, you, you, sh you. As far as I know, and I don't know that there's any case law on on that. Or that question has been answered. My my gut reaction on that would be, you as an individual, have that right. Your parents can't necessarily waive it for you. Okay. Um, so an eight-year-old refuses to talk to the police, and, and mommy and daddy can't say, "Oh no, you don't." Well, they can. They can say you're gonna. Right yeah. They they can do that. Okay. And then the kid might talk. And that I don't know what a judge necessarily would do with that, is what I'm saying. I, I mean, that would be the appropriate thing. I would certainly take their statement. Um, and with, with that 13-year-old, the, the Keyshawn man, the, the murder case, really, he was given Miranda. They were at the police station. And he started you know, giving a couple different stories. And uh, the dad goes, you know, and then he was kind of like not talking a little bit. And the dad says, man up now, what happened? So it did happen, but it never got, it, the issue wasn't necessarily raised because nobody technically invoked Miranda in that, in that case, but the kid really didn't want to talk a lot until his dad said, enough of this. What happened? Um, and your story's not making any sense. So good question on that one too, but I, and I, don't have an, I don't know that there's a case that says one way or the other if a parent can, can waive your rights. So. And, I, and I'm once again always, and I think this was part of my uh, appellate days, um, when, and actually Pablo, when he started, said, I saw more action in the trial court. I do to a degree, but I've had one of some of my craziest cases where arguments in the Supreme Court, so you get all these weird questions that come up, but they don't always answer them. So we try to raise issues, we try to get them answered, but they don't always answer them. They just choose to do what they, they care to do. Know. They don't know, yeah, it's probably like, I don't want to talk about this issue. So. Yes. Um, this is kind of changing the topic a little bit, but what what is typically done with runaways? Like, say you have a 15 year old and mom reports them missing, and then you find them at three in the morning at his friend's house or something. Do you just drop them off at home and move on, or do you? Did everybody hear the question? What do you do with a runaway? Um, generally, what I would say to do, especially if they're going to pose a risk, okay, I would say take them to detention. But the problem with that is, is detention unless they have a court order to the contrary aren't really supposed to hold runaways for a very long period of time, which to me is just crazy, 
I mean, we have a kid who's running away, yet detention isn't really supposed to be able to keep him because it's a status offense. Okay? Remember how I said runaways would be a status offense? There's no penalty necessarily associated with it. Like, you can't say it's a misdemeanor 93 days in jail. They will keep them for a period of time, and if they continue to be a chronic runaway, I've actually even had judges come to me and say, Vicki, I want a runaway charge on him, and I want him picked up and put in detention. I will judge, all right, fine, I'll charge him with a runaway, but technically they're not supposed to keep him. He goes, they'll keep him if they have a court order. Go, well, Dad, that's up to you then. You know, you, you issue the order, then you're right. So they have to hold him. And then, I guess, along with that, at what age can you move out without your parents' consent? Is that 17? Um, move out without parents' consent. Uh, it might even be 16, but 17 you can because you're no longer considered uh, a minor. And I believe there's been a recent change in terms of, of ages. Uh, there's been a recent change that will take effect, I think, for anybody born now that uh, you have to, you're going to be required to go to school until you're age 18. I believe that just, I don't know, did you read that? It, yeah, I, I think there's some, no, I still have some. Thanks. There's a recent legislation, because now you don't have to, once you reach 16, you really don't have to go to school. There's not much somebody can do about it, but now they're going to raise that age to 18. For anybody, and I, I just read it the other day, but I forgot the age that it starts at. Um, and so you try to do what you can with them, but if they want to move out at some point, they're going to move out, and we won't have any jurisdiction. Are the same Pardon? Are emancipated minors treated still through the juvenile system? Yes. Yes, they would be. In terms, in terms of for um, crimes that they would commit, yes. Now, what they, whether they would be when they do for contract, contract law, that, I, don't, I don't know on that one. You know, I'm telling you, he's loving yeah. this stuff. My answer would be no. <laughs> I don't think you would, because who would you ask? You know, there would be nobody that you could ask on those. Does anybody have any other basic questions or anything else you want to know about juvenile law? I know I went through it kind of fast and I'm not sure what they're going to put on the test or anything other than I, if I know Pablo he's going to ask something about fingerprints but uh, any, any other questions? I mean I can happily answer any that you might have in terms of, yes? With the uh, minor in possession, what if parents are allowed in, the, in their home? Do you go after the juvenile and the parent? You can, yes, absolutely. They could be, you know, furnishing minor, or excuse me, furnishing alcohol to a minor. Is that um, a yes. Um, so yeah, that you can go after them, yes, uh, with a parent, and it, and it's often done that way, where they, they have it. Um, the minor in possessions uh, of alcohol or tobacco are. I like. I always when I get a retail fraud, if they've stolen cigarettes or they stole um, alcohol, I always. Well, I just uh, always, sometimes I'll do a twofer on that one. I'll charge them with the retail fraud and also with the minor in possession. That way I can do a plea deal one for one. <laughs> so, uh, but that, I know that makes me sound mean, but sometimes we, we, sometimes you just need jurisdiction over these kids because they're out going crazy and somebody's got to keep an eye on them because either their parents aren't or their parents can't because some of these kids are out of control. They're just, you know, there's not much that you can do, do with them. Um, in fact, the 17-year-old the who was murdered on Saturday, I don't know if you guys read about that, was dropped off at the hospital and later died, which is always a key indication when some, somebody says dropped off at the hospital as opposed to somebody taking them in. You know, you already got an issue with what happened. In that particular case, that juvenile uh, has quite an extensive history with ours, including his uh, last crime that we had with him was... Um, uh, he was in a vehicle, or the police had been called to his parents' home because of a domestic, um, and domestic situations are the biggest chance for things to blow up you're going to find, obviously, and I, I don't know if other people have talked to you about it. You'll get there, and, you know, mom saying, well, a kid hit me, they're doing this, and the second you go try to talk to the kid and and the kids being belligerent and, and still being out of control, you're trying to arrest them. Then all of a sudden, mom's beating on your head for taking, you know, her kid. Um, we had a melee that, that occurred on that situation. Um, and when uh, the sergeant from uh, Grand Rapids uh, PD was trying to seat, uh, he finally got him in the car and he was trying to put his, the kid's seatbelt on, which you need to do. Kid just absolutely headbutted the officer. 
blood everywhere. It was that was Griff, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So and that, well, that's the, the kid that was that was murdered that that did that. So in that particular case, I a roundabout way to this is that the parents really had no control over that kid, or at some point gave up control, or were such enablers that no one could really do much to help that kid, because we certainly had been given numerous chances. Two question? Nope. Status offenses. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm really clear. Okay. Just offenses that you're only guilty by virtue of your age. Correct. Your MIP or your. Hit. Yeah, and I guess maybe I when I said I wouldn't put MIP as a status offense, I, I still wouldn't necessarily because you can have it if you're, if you're older than as a juvenile. But yes, it's it's one. It's by nature of your age, and but as a general rule, a status offense is one where there's no PAC code for it. There's no necessarily, well, there is, but it's not your normal uh, criminal statute because there's no penalty associated with it. It doesn't, if you're a runaway, it doesn't say you're guilty. If you're a runaway, you're guilty of a 93 day misdemeanor. Okay, it doesn't have a penalty associated with it. Does it say just you can't be a runaway? Yeah, you can't be a runaway, but what, it, but what it does say is that you'll be subject, you can be subject to court jurisdiction. And that's how we do it is that if they're a runaway, if they're a chronic runaway, sometimes we get them in the court's jurisdiction and they're made a temporary ward of the court. And once again, we can go through, they can be placed on probation. If they're a chronic runaway, we might put them in foster care, because um, for whatever situation at home, or an institutional placement. So there are some of the options that are available to judges on, uh, when we treat juveniles. Yes? Uh, Richard Marecki. So say they're charged and, and it goes formal. Um, to be considered delinquent, a judge has to, is that how it works, right? From my understanding, doesn't a judge, they're the ones that, I guess. Okay, yeah, I could have followed up on that a little more. When it goes formal, all right, what happens then is literally the um, child will either plead guilty to whatever we charge them with or we go to trial and they're found guilty. That will all happen in front of a judge then. If it's formal and there's an adjudication, inevitably, unless there's a warrant and dismissed, which doesn't happen terribly often, they're made temporary ward to the court and then the judge has a tremendous amount of authority over them because they can place them in detention or they can once again place them out of home. So when it goes formal it's in front of a judge and or or referee but it's the same difference on that. But to be considered delinquent is mm -hmm. that just the title that goes with any juvenile that goes through the system or do they actually have to be I don't know well, I, I don't know if necessarily it needs to have a title. I mean, I would consider somebody who's had an adjudication, that, that's a juvenile delinquent is, is really what's, how it would become. Um, I can call some people juvenile delinquents even if they've never been charged because they probably should have been somewhere along the way. But it's just, yeah, just kind of form that they, a title that they would say, look, this is a juvenile delinquent person and they come under the, the jurisdiction of, of the court. Um, and usually you have to say because they're under the age of 17, and although on occasion um, we can charge that back to that situation where I said I couldn't charge somebody after their 18th birthday, if we had have found that person, even if they were 17, but prior to their 18th birthday, we can we can snag them in. We can get jurisdiction. I don't have to ask the court for it on those cases. What do you have to do with uh, you know the 16-year-old who technically commits a CSC with his 15-year-old girlfriend? <laughs> what, what, what I usually do with those is nothing. Um, one, the 16-year-old, the of course, the age of consent for, for sex is 16 um, by statute. The 15, so the 16-year-old technically committed a violation, a CSC third, because, well, actually, probably a CSC, uh, well, depending on what they did, um, technically did something illegal because 15 is, it wasn't the age of consent, but I would not charge it. We don't have enough hours in the day to take care of high school drama uh, <laughs> that goes along with it. I even had a case the other day, uh, officer called me, uh, a 15 year old and a, well just, he had just turned 16 I think, and the girl just maybe turned 14, so they were having sex when 15, 13, she's pregnant, and which will open up another can of worms, obviously. But uh, the question came, neither parent really wanted anything done uh, in that situation, and I didn't charge. And a lot of times I'll get questions, that will be 15, 14, 14, 14, 13, 13, 12, 13, having sex. 
and I'll get the phone call, you know, you need, what do you want to do? Most of the agencies, police agencies, know what I'll do, but sometimes they have to check, and I'm, saying, I, 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 I'm not going to charge. And then they'll go, well, the parents can be really upset about that. And so what I do when the parent calls, you know, let's say I have a 14-year-old and a 13-year-old, and I said, well, should I charge your daughter? Well, it's usually the father, somebody calls and saying, why don't you charge this guy for having sex with my daughter? And my response is, well, your daughter engaged in illegal activity. She had sex with somebody under the age of 16. So should I charge your daughter? And usually blah, blah, blah. And the other part of that is they both, I can't prove my case, okay? I wouldn't be able to prove it if two 14-year-olds are having sex. Because why? They each have a right against self-incrimination. I, I couldn't make the victim get on the stand because if she said, yeah, I had sex with this person, that they're admitting to committing an illegal act. So they have a right against self-incrimination. So I can't even prove those cases sometimes. So when I usually charge them, a lot of my cases, uh, probably the majority of my CSC cases that I charge involve probably between the age of 12 and 15 years old. Well, now I'm going to take that back because I certainly get 10-year-olds and people go, well, why are you charging a 10-year-old? Well, if I have a 10-year-old that's diddling a 2-year-old, that's not doctor, okay? Because people go, oh, they're just kids experimenting. 10-year-old doing something with a 2-year-old, that's beyond experimenting. If I get two 6- or 7-year-olds playing dare, which you'll find a lot, the truth or dare game, that starts a whole lot of Apparently, it happens in college as well, but you know, in high school, <laughs> they start now in grade school with their truth or dare. You know, you no know, spin the bottle is truth or dare. Those you just try to say. Uh, in fact, I had a case the other day. Somebody called, and I, there's a group of two seven or seven year olds, eight year old, and a nine year old, all doing something in a closet. And they said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "Well, I want you to go out with the big bad police officer routine, and you know, go in there and say, don't do this anymore." type thing. So that's how we treat a lot of those. But we certainly get our share of, like I said, 15-year-olds that I charge who have sex with, 7-year-olds. Um, and the, once you get age differentials that they are that big, you, you have to start looking at them. Or back even with my 7-year-old, while I certainly don't think he understood everything, we clearly can't have that kind of conduct you know, going on in those cases. So that's a, a long answer to a very short question, but that's what we do with them. You know, these are the fruits I've noticed seem to really appreciate practical mm. information and kind of more hands on stuff. What, what's the best advice you can give them when they're out on the street or out doing their thing as far as dealing with juveniles? Um, say, especially in the inner city where all these gangs are, are now rearing their ugly heads. What, what advice would you give them? Well, I think part of what I said before was make sure you're safe first. We're finding an incredible amount of weapons, of, of guns being used uh, in crime. So make sure whatever you do, don't assume just because you're going to be talking to a 12-year-old or a 13 or a 14-year-old or a 10-year-old that they're not armed, okay? Because they certainly can be, all right? Um, so always approach it with caution on your part. Okay, like I said, if you're approaching something where you the shots were fired and you're showing up somewhere and you're trying to figure out what the heck is going on, make sure you're safe. Okay, yes. Can uh, they give their own consent to allow you to search them? Or do you do yes. Nope. They can. You, they can do it. And you can also. I mean, if, if the question was, you need consent to have from a parent to search them. No, especially if you can easily show that you needed to do a Terry. Uh, or, a, you know, just for, once again, for your safety to figure out what's going on. And it's not unheard of sometimes, just you need to put some people in handcuffs and, and you sort it out later. Um, yes? Um, as far as opposite sex goes, does it make a difference for juveniles? In terms female? I would say that uh, the rules, probably, whatever you do with, with adults, obviously you have to be a little more careful, I, I guess the answer to that would be. It, and quite frankly, your guys going to always be subject to, oh, they touched me you know, in the wrong spot and they did it on purpose when they were frisking me. I guess maybe try to have somebody else there, another officer, uh, so that you can at least have some cooperation that I did not do that. Um, but if you need to search somebody, search, okay? Like I said, I'm, I'll always defend, most actions are defensible as far as I'm concerned. Um, is, as long as you guys are acting within the line of your duty, um, are, are defendable. So if you need to pat down a girl, 
pat her down. So that's so in kind of the, back to and once again the practical. And the other thing, like I said, is, and I don't want to make everybody in this room a bunch of, of, of cynics, but it's it is kind of crazy. I don't know if you knew there was a, a robbery at Allen Bob's. It's a sporting place, and about ten handguns were stolen. Okay, I know who did it. I can't prove who did it. Okay. Those guns already have shown up, one in a, a shooting where a kid is now paralyzed. Uh, two others have shown up, um, one following an armed robbery um, where we found it in a home. So those guns just get places and they get places fast and they're being used by juveniles to commit crimes. No, it wasn't and it was some good police work uh, on everybody's part. Um, we picked some kids up fairly close to the to the area where it occurred shortly afterwards. Unfortunately, the video um, in the store wasn't very conclusive. Um, the kids didn't have the guns on them by the time we found them. So we're, we're, we're working on it. I'm not saying it's never gonna be solved, but we're pretty confident the kids we had committed it, but I can't prove it at this point. Um, so I guess for practical experience, that would be my, my to do with that. And the other thing is, and like I said, I don't wanna scare everybody, is be respectful. You know, if you just try to feed everybody with respect, they can't come back later and say you're you were you were being a jerk. I like it. I always love it when I have stuff on video and the officer is just as professional as you can be, and the person's going crazy, but you're maintaining your professionalism. That looks awesome in court. So when they start arguing that you did something or something, you can go, no, I you know, I tried to do what I needed to do. And then sometimes if you need to use some physical force. Um, what, what's the term that I love the best? I gently, you know, I assisted him to the ground. <laughs> I, I always love that one. Yeah, thank you. But uh, if, if you need to do that, do it, you know. Um, I, I guess I'd say you, you can't treat them like necessarily with kid gloves just because they're kids. Yes? Do children say they miss like an informal, like a failure to appear at it or something? Do they get issued a petition or a warrant and lean? Like for a fire to appear? Yes, yes, we can have pickups, uh, pickup orders. So that would hit on yep. then? Yes, it should. Yep, we have this, a situation where if they fail to appear to court, they're not doing what they need to do, we definitely have pickup orders. And then you can you can arrest them and take them to detention, and hopefully detention doesn't release them. Do they call them bench warrants just like for adults? Yeah, usually they call pickup orders. On occasion, we'll get a, what they'll a term a bench warrant. It has the same practical effect um, on situations. But they're usually just called a pickup order. And they do want to leave? Yeah, they're supposed to. So you should be able to find out if you have a kid. Although sometimes I, I do know uh, when I say they're supposed to, that's why I say it that way. A bench warrant, quite frankly, usually makes sure it gets there. For some reason, it has a little more, what's the word I want to use, uh, teeth behind it in some ways because they say, oh, it's a bench, a bench warrant as opposed to a pickup. But it should be this practical effect. There is a court order in place saying that this person should be picked up uh, and apprehended if you have them. Any other? See, this is the part I like when you guys just ask questions so I know you're awake, but okay. <laughs> Any other questions or anything? Anything else you want me to cover that I didn't on that uh, public that you can think of? Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't even know what I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned that you have a little bit of experience with the Department of Corrections. Yeah. Uh, what's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. Uh, what's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process like for applying for the position? Yeah. What's the process Okay. I never know what they mean by that. My, that my, yeah, my guess would be that, my, my guess on that would be that once again, that maybe make sure you're clean, make sure there's no adults getting fingerprinted oh. in the area or something like that. Because it, it is, there's definitely supposed to keep them separate. And it, it creates some issues even down uh, at the uh, courthouse. Um, because they're supposed to keep, you know, they might be transporting juveniles over for a case. They're supposed to be keeping them separate, so sometimes it takes longer to transport uh, some of our juveniles to cases, or sometimes if they're transporting a juvenile, they're not supposed to be transporting an adult in the same area. So my, I, I guess my response or thought would be that they are saying, clear it out, we're coming in, so we can get in, get them fingerprinted, and get them over to detention. 
And quite frankly, I have never, ever understood why detention doesn't have, why off, police agencies can't go to detention and do that processing. It's made zero sense to me forever. And go to the jail first. Yeah, that's where, the, that's where they can be fingerprinted. Detention doesn't have the ability to fingerprint. Well, those the probation officers have. Well, they do, but they're, they're over in the courthouse. It doesn't necessarily happen that night with, with probation officers. It can happen later. Um, but the, like I said, technically they're supposed to be fingerprinted by the police agencies. So detention should have it, and police agencies should be able to use it. But they're kind of half and half. There's a, a number of them. A lot of the community probation officers are uh, out of the Cedar uh, Cedar Street, and some are out of detention. Or excuse me, uh, the courthouse. That's where their offices are located. Yeah, it's kind of split. On those. And I, I don't know what how the split came about. It's just some are there and some aren't. I don't know what, what goes into that. And then, but once again, one other thing, just so nobody, because uh, I have a lot of good friends that are probation officers, and uh, I, we have a standing, you know, March Madness drinking situations. So they're my friends. So I don't want you to think they think they're all, that they, don't, they do a great job, a lot of them. Some are just, to me, a little too lenient with the juveniles. I don't think it does anybody any good. I personally think that <clears throat> they should be, if we took care of some of these kids who are in 8, 9, and 10, instead of just saying, oh, don't do that again, we would have a little less crime. But once again, I'm, I'm not in charge. I'll just sit around and try to do my best. So that's all we can do. And then we just turn them over to, to district court, to Pablo, and they turn 17. So, oh, not my problem now. <laughs> so, OK, any other questions or anything? All right. Any other questions for Vicki? All right. Then I will go to work. Thanks, guys. Did you get your complimentary coffee?